Coming up on Techzilla, it's a big week for upgrades. Don't get ripped off with monthly modem charges. Robert tears open a deluxe home theater PC, and wow, have a lot of y'all been scanning slides and negatives. So fill your ice cream bowl and get medieval with the hot fudge, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is brought to you by the Motorola Zoo, Netflix. Go to netflix.com slash techzilla to get a free trial membership in Maru iPad covers. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to Techzilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Hey, whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech, or the best way to remove scratches from your sister's iPad you weren't supposed to be using in the first place. Hey, we've got an answer for you. And if we don't, we'll track down somebody who does. Glorious, an absolutely glorious week for upgrades last week. What's up? Okay, iOS 4.3 dropped, bringing oh, a nice. faster Safari, user's choice over the switch on the side of the iPad, which makes me very happy, and personal hotspot, aka tethering to the iPhone. Three devices max for the tethering. That's an iOS 4.3 thing, not an AT&T thing, shockingly enough. I'll be checking this one out, though, which uh, I, if, if everything I've gotten so far is correctly, because I've been following in gadgets reporting on uh, iPhone tethering quite closely, uh, it'll require the like $35 a month data pro plan. Okay and a $20 a month tethering charge. It's basically all the cell phone vendors nail you with a tethering charge if you want to use, not just AT&T, everybody. You want to tether off your phone, they want to get an extra $20 plus a month out of you. You can usually do it for free if you're willing to give up the high-speed network, but then what's the whole point? Or jailbreak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Apple TV does not get iOS 4.3, but it did get NBA League Pass, MLB.TV, and Netflix 5.1 audio support. Yes. Nice. Surround sound from the Netflix. Finally. And as many, many, many irritated MLB fans tweeted and wrote, local blackout still applies, so if you're a Mets fan in New York City, you can't see the Mets. Same for the Yankees. And there's no NHL, and nobody, not even Roku, has managed to get NFL games streaming on the internets. Wah, wah, wah. NFL doesn't care about the internet. Uh, blackouts annoy me. I mean, uh, I'm a fan of the Oakland Raiders. How often do I get to watch their games on TV? Almost never. Well, unless they're away. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So every other game. And Sony, they are adding cloud storage for game saves to PSN Plus subscribers. Uh, the Windows blog says IE9 will launch on March 15th. Mm -hmm. March 15th, March 14th. 14th. 9 a.m. Pacific Standard, March 14th, IE9 hits the interweb. Really? Yeah. I'm hoping a lot of people go from IE6 to Am I just using the beta IE9. or something? Maybe. Maybe. The, anyway, I've been using it for a while. It's pretty good. Okay. I always has come from like 4.1 to 4.3. Yeah. And in, in the in the time that the Windows Phone 7 has been released and not updated, period, iOS has gone from 4.1 to 4.3. I, I it, why? windowsphonesecrets.com is is Paul Thoreau's uh, Windows Phone 7 website. He's it's it's just he's pissed. He's frustrated. He's angry. He's like at, you know, Apple does all of this unbelievably cool stuff, and, and you know, they're relatively transparent about operating system upgrades, if nothing else. And he's just sitting here like, he's waiting for the upgrade for his Samsung phone that allow him to do upgrades on his Samsung phone, unless I, that's actually been finally released. I'm sure there's a bunch of Android platform users, too, just wishing they could just take the latest version of the OS and install it at will. But... Yeah, but that's okay. That's like a carrier issue or a platform issue, yeah. but it's not like there has been no Android updates since the beginning of Android. For that's months. true. That's true. Android's been, you know, Windows Phone Seven's been out. Where are the updates? Where's the love? And uh, in the other news, maybe maybe it's the whole Nokia deal slowing them down, or Microsoft just been too distracted watching the Kinect for the Xbox 360 score a Guinness world record as the fastest selling consumer electronics device. Yeah, they've sold a lot of them. Apparently outselling the iPhone and iPad in the first 60 days. It's pretty cool. 10 though. million total since the thing was released. It's pretty amazing for a product that a game, it's an accessory. game console accessory, exactly, <laughs> that, that people are buying not only for the fun aspect of it, but also research and development. There's a lot of cool stuff going on, hack-wise, that Isn't people are just trying to do cool things with, with, a, with an add-on for a game console. And I just, I think that's awfully cool. It's, it's I don't know, it's, it's been like, everybody I knew who reviews games were like, huh, didn't see that coming. Hmm. And the mayor writes in, I have a Verizon DSL and the Westel 327W router, which no longer puts out a wireless signal. I can call Verizon and have it replaced, but I was wondering if you guys would recommend me spending the money and buying something better than what they would install. 
I've been told that all routers come with the same default IP address, but Verizon may have a password or setup that is proprietary, and an off-the-shelf unit may not be plug-and-play. What do you guys think? Thanks, the mayor in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, so the Westel 327, the, the modem, the, the, the modem slash router you're talking about, actually has Ethernet ports on the back. You could just buy a new router and plug it into the Ethernet port on the back of the one you have. Uh, I would see if Verizon DSL has a standalone modem, um, basically, and then buy yourself a quality router. Like, it, it, That's for, my setup at home. Yeah. I mean, I think it kind of comes down to, do they charge you a monthly fee for that modem? That's what I'm wondering. Are you, yeah. are you leasing that product? And if it's costing you, you might as well at least take it back in and get a, one that works, or simplify it down to just the, just the modem itself, add the router like Pat mentioned. And, uh, and there's a million of them to choose from out there. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's kind of like broadband reports is a good place. You can search around and, you know, in, in forums. Um, last I checked, Verizon uses a standard ADSL, so any compatible modem should work. Basically, their encryption, basically the thing that locks down your access to your DSL account is standard and should work with any uh, DSL modem. And I got to say, you know, if they, if, they're not, if they don't charge you a monthly fee for the modem, have them send you a modem. If they do charge you a monthly fee, look at how much that monthly fee is. Because for me, I spent like $65 on a cable modem because uh, I use Comcast. And that modem paid for itself in less than a year because, the, because of the, the, the equipment fees they were charging for the modem. Yeah. I hate combination modem routers. I prefer separate boxes. Um, you know, in terms of routers, uh, you know, do you have 802.11b, 802.11g, or are you upgrading to 802.11n? I'd go um, in at this point. Yeah, it's time to go to, well, unless he doesn't have any hardware that supports n at the other end. True. But, you know, but n routers will do your combo G. mode. <laughs> yeah. It's, Small I mean, net builder, do you still recommend those guys? I love just looking up. Builder. If you're looking for a wireless router, they have a great table of what they've tested recently in a real world environment. I think it's the guy's house he actually tests everything in. The it's, same environment. It's, any. it's the most comprehensive. And it's a great way just to say, you know what, here's the advantage of spending X dollars more on this particular brand versus the cheaper brand and things like that. Yeah, yeah. WNDR, extremely useful. Uh, Netgear's WNDR 3700 is super popular. Everybody knew has bought one, has raved about it. Um, that might be one to consider. There's some new routers from Logitech that are getting pretty high scores, too. Really? Yeah. Wouldn't have thought to look there. Logitech is back, baby. Excellent. Um, should we explain the default IP address thing? It's it's a little different for everyone. <laughs> well, I mean, it's kind of funny, right? You, your DSL provider or your cable modem provider, they will give you, they will DHCP usually, unless you get a static IP, assign you an IP address. That is different from the IP addresses used in your house. Generally, you know, there's an IP address that your modem connects through, sort of through the wide area network port. That's the one that goes to the DSL modem or the uh, cable modem. And then interior, it does DHCP inside your house to assign IP addresses to all the computers and devices that attach the internet in your house. Um, 192.168.0.1 or, or 192.168.1.1 or whatever you assign to it, because that's basically closed inside your house. Don't worry about the default IP address of the router you're using. No. I also find, too, usually on those devices, you look at the bottom and there's a sticker there that actually says what the specific login is mm -hmm. for that device, if it hasn't been changed already. Always so. a plus. Always, <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Netflix. Netflix delivers movies directly to your home, saving you time, money, and hassle. As a Netflix Unlimited member, you can instantly watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streaming directly to your PC, Mac, or right to your TV via Netflix-ready device like the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and the Nintendo Wii console. Plus, get DVDs by mail in about one business day. Watch as many movies as you want, any time you want. There are never any late fees or due dates. As a new member and a Techzilla viewer, you can get a free trial membership. Go to www.netflix.com slash techzilla and sign up now. Be sure to use this URL so that they know we sent you. Time to get our HD Nation on at Yummy Bacon. Tweeted at Patrick Norton at Robert Heron. Just sold my copy of Avatar on Blu-ray 3D for $125. This 3D stuff is for reals. People are clamoring for content. No, that's, a, that's a shrewd investment right there. That probably <laughs> paid for the whole pack that got you that disc to begin with, unless you had to get the TV, of course. That's a little bit more. But yeah, people, I think it's good timing. You made $125 on that disc because it's impossible to get Avatar in the 3D Blu-ray version without buying like a Blu-ray player or a television or whatever bundle it's set up with. Scarcity. It's not because people are like, <gasps> I need 3D. <laughs> Maybe you know, that movie, though. I could... I, 
I bet you that's a popular sale if you need a quick 125 bucks. And it may be the only great 3D movie in existence right now. Yeah, Coraline. That was. Oh, I don't know if it's great, true. but I I found it. It's quality. Awesome. <laughs> Dark. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, what about an HDMI dongle for the iPad too? Huh? Huh? Hey, it works with the iPad, iPhones, at least latest iPhones. Uh, mirroring basically only on the iPad too. 1080p support. Well, 720p only for streaming. 1080p. They're saying for. Pictures? Yeah, it's really weird. It's like they're saying they're mirroring, they're supporting 1080p, but then there's like streaming of movies in 720p only. Oh, so if you want to demo, like the whole out, the, the display output on right. the portable device can just be mirrored. That's what they mean, mirroring onto the display itself. It's a little messy, right? Because it's it's unclear if it's 720p because that's what iTunes movie are movies are, or if it's 720p for HDCP compliance. Or there's, there's, something doesn't make sense, and we won't know until one of us gets the dongle in our hands. It, it could be a decoding thing too because decoding higher resolutions is right. requires more horsepower than it would say record, uh, decoding something at a lower resolution and 720p is about half as many pixels as 1080p. So. I thought there was going to be enough power in the A5 processor to do we 1080p think. decoding. The first thing I'm going to try as soon as I get that dongle for my <laughs> iPhone 4 is to load up a 1080p file and a 720p file and see which one plays. It'll be nice though to do all my encoding for just 720p rather than say the iPhone 4's format or the iPad's right. format. Have a more HD standard than say the specific resolution of the device. Don't you want which, 1080p output from everything? I would like that, but you know, <laughs> I mean, the files get pretty darn large too. So if I can get a good 720p encode and it's and it's being able to stream that directly mm -hmm. to a TV and give me the full quality, hopefully in surround sound. But probably if I'm going to encode it, I'm going to be stuck with stereo most likely. But are, are that's you going to okay. buy an iPad too? No, uh, maybe. <laughs> they, you know what? They, Apple or somebody from Apple called me the other day when I bought one as a gift for somebody and uh, my mom and. Uh, they called me to talk to me about something, but I wasn't around, so and they never called me back. So mm. probably just to say, oh, you know, we have the two version two coming up soon, sir. You know, we can we can sell you a case for that. You can set it to Bob and have it engraved. My my one iPhone product is enough for the time being. <laughs> <laughs> That's good enough. As I mentioned last episode, thanks to the ever vigilant HD Nation and Texilla audience, I scored a refurbished Optoma HD one eighty, which is essentially the same exact thing is the HD20 off sellout.woot for 650 bucks. Nice. At Walt All wrote, at Patrick Norton, make sure to check the cost of replacement lamps for the Optoma. It's a scam. Uh, no, actually, bulbs just haven't dropped in price as fast as projectors have. Totally. I mean, yeah. the, basically, they just haven't scaled bulb production in the way that they have decreased the cost of projectors. Projector bulbs are expensive. Those those lamps, in your case, it's, it's a third of the cost of the whole projection system is the quality is the lamp module itself. And in high end projectors, it can get ridiculous. It's like Xeon bulbs for like right. two to four thousand dollars on a twenty thousand dollar projector. Yeah, or even 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 those those affordable like right. six to eight thousand dollar projectors are sometimes affordable. equipped with you know a two thousand dollar. You a said quarter. affordable. Well, okay, affordable compared to a twenty-five. Air quotes. I mean, yeah, you know, it's a price of a small car. Anyway. The thing is, though, is projector bulbs <laughs> are part of the cost. Whether it's a front projector or a rear projector, if you're buying a projector, be aware that bulbs are part of the operating cost. Doesn't matter if it's a front projector or rear projector. Bulbs should last a minimum of three thousand hours. If there is a low power setting in your uh, projectors. Set up. See if it's bright enough for you, because you should get a modest reduction in brightness and extend battery life like 20, 30 percent. And definitely shop around because bulb prices. Because I looked at bulb prices, I saw bulb prices were the same bulb anywhere from 140 to 290 dollars. That's so true too. Shop carefully. Just make sure you're getting the one that's specifically made for your device. So <laughs> a, it'll fit properly, but b, you don't want it, it to be too far out of spec and melt everything. That could be <laughs> that could be an issue, but. What about so we talked about screens? You were kind of horrified that the monoprice project, the monoprice, the f screens up on the the motorized screens on monoprice were like three hundred bucks. You're 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 held on on getting something that's motorized, so it can retract yeah. up and get out of the way. Well, I, I mean, I couldn't do a manual one, but I totally. But that's that's. I've got a Harmony remote. I want to hit like exactly. the one button and have everything happen. And, and what surprised me is if you look at the price for tensioned screens, where there are either tabs or other uh, materials that hold the screen tight, so it's always nice and flat. Those screens tend to be really expensive. Uh, usually, they like start at hundred thousand dollars. They started, yeah, depending on what size you're looking for, easily can start at you know, seven eight hundred dollars and go on up. And considering you didn't spend that much just on the projector itself, <laughs> I found something called Favi, F A V I. They're, uh, I don't know how good. Of, it's basically a Chinese-made brand of projection screens that aren't tensioned, but they're. Very affordable. We're talking a 92-inch screen. I think we picked out for yeah, like $175. $175. Motorized. Motorized. IR and I think it was also you could RF. trigger it with a 12-volt system too if you really want to go 
Nice. For getting your home automation on. Would you, or do you like, I mean, do you think attention screen, I mean, I, if you have the money, attention screen is the way to go? Over the long term, mm -hmm. because if it's not tensioned, there's, it's more likely that the screen will develop either curves or wrinkles or something to it over time, uh, especially the action of winding it up and basically unfurling it and furling it back up can when cause it to... When your three-year-old grabs it and starts you, swinging on the bottom? It depends on the quality of the materials, too, because if it, if it, as it scrolls up, and if, if the materials are soft enough to where they can mold nicely as mm -hmm. it rolls, if not, you'll see these little fine crease lines in some projector screens. And, you know, it, it's sure it still works, but you lose that bit of, bit of quality over time. And that's what's nice about having something that's actually tensioned or stretched to stay taught and, you know, it looks like thought, it was the day you took it out of the box. If there's a breeze in the house, my screen's going to blow back and forth, isn't it? A little bit, maybe. <laughs> it depends. It depends what the air currents are doing and how heavy that bar will be hanging at the bottom of the screen. So, I, I think though, for spending a $650 projector, mating that with a sub $200 screen, that's a good starting point, and you can always take it up from there. You know, if it doesn't work out, hey, you're not out $1,000 for a screen. You're only out less than $200. If you have a slightly used tension screen you'd like to sell me, please let me know. But I, normally I would use a painted wall, but that's not an option in my current house. Okay. There's no wall there. Oh, no, that is, that is true. That and is you know what? If all else fails, it, it, you don't have to have a screen with a projector either. I mean, it's, it's nice to have that consistent surface, but you could shoot this into curtains, uh, a wall that's not too textured, anything really, just to get that picture going for you. And you can always do screens and think about how you want to do that down the road. I think it's more important just to actually get the projector itself and you know run your content through it and get used to actually having that as a display device. Did you order the D8000 yet? Yeah, it, the size I want hasn't been released yet. Oh. And, I'm, and I'm, I want to see what LG, and we're talking TVs here. I'm, I'm itching to buy a new TV <laughs> this year. I've had my current uh, LCD flat panel. It's about three and a half years old, probably going on four. It's black levels are nothing the way the new TVs are. Yeah. The liquid inky black you're getting off the latest screens. I'm looking at Samsung's D8000, and they have the 55 inch out right now, and they have a 46 inch model, and they're also gonna have larger screen sizes too, up to 65 inches, I believe. Uh, but I wanna see what LG's doing. I wanna see what Panasonic's new uh, VT30 plasma display looks like. Got a lot of new TVs, and they're all starting to trickle out now. I noticed this in that while I was looking at prices over the last couple of weeks, you'll notice that last year's models, mm -hmm. the price stopped declining, and then it slowly started going back up, and it's like, oh, that kind of just hits me in the head. It's like, okay, the new models new are models about are to be released, so just sit back and see what happens. And now, the new models are already decreasing in price slow, slowly over time, so. Let's fire up a question from Russ, who writes in. I have a question regarding my NAS, Blu-ray, and streaming. I've been experimenting with any DVD HD with my DVDs via Twonky. This is what QNAP uses on my PC. This works, it's great, and it's very simple. I would love to stream my Blu-rays as well. I am hugely anti-piracy, and this is purely for my own usage. I understand how I can decrypt the Blu-ray onto my hard drive, but to stream, do I need to create an H.264 or an MKV file? This seems very complicated. I've read that I need to use a demuxer, such as TS Muxer or EAC 3TO to mix the video and audio. Is there an easier process? I don't want to compress, I just want to stream. Please help! Thanks, Russ. Funny you should ask. I do this all the time. Um, streaming a Blu-ray disc or a DVD image file, uh, basically, if, when you, if you, you're converting those discs into image files, I assume that's what you're doing. That image file is pretty easy to play on a PC. Either install a player program that supports the playback of that image file, VLC does this very nicely, or you could use a virtual, basically a DVD drive or a Blu-ray drive that's software-based, and then you mount the image into the software player and play it back using whatever program you prefer. Uh, my favorite virtual optical drive app happens to be Slysoft's virtual clone drive. It's free. There are a couple others out there. I would stick with this one unless you've got a reason to not use it. <laughs> free is a good price. Transcoding, though, your main movie from the DVD or Blu-ray into the H.264 format or into an MKV wrapper isn't that difficult either. Uh, you have any DVD HD, and that takes care of the decryption and the protection circumvention. You gotta do that. <laughs> and an encoder, uh, tools like Handbrake, Make MKV, or even RIP.264, the Handbrake and RIPBOT being free options, will get that job done if you just want to convert that into H.264 or an MKV file for streaming. And however, if, if you're streaming this content from your NAS device to a home theater PC, I wouldn't even bother with transcoding. I would just simply mount that on the home theater PC and just play it back right off the network. It works really well. I do it over gigabit ethernet. Mm -hmm. I've had less 
luck doing that over wireless N, although it could just be my wireless N setup. I've heard other people tell me they had no problems whatsoever doing that kind of high bitrate streaming. You also live in a densely packed apartment building. I do, but I'm just like, eh, it should work. <laughs> hey, it's now time for the new Blu-ray releases for the week of March 15th, 2011. First up, BMX Bandits. This 1983 Australian cult classic is Nicole Kidman's first movie. This is a region-free release, and despite being an 80s film, Blu-ray.com says that they were, quote, caught off guard by how strong the film's 1080p ABC encoded transfer is, and says it's, quote, vivid and bright with more eye-popping primary hues than a Goddard film, unquote. Extras include an audio commentary with the director, a 38-minute featurette with the cast and crew, and a three-minute piece from an Australian kids show featuring a 16-year-old Nicole Kidman promoting the film. So if you're in the mood for a cheesy but fun feel-good 80s flick, check out BMX Bandits. Next up, The Fighter. This 2010 film is based on the true story of a boxer from Massachusetts, played by Mark Wahlberg, and his ex-boxer brother, played by Christian Bale, who won an Oscar for his performance. With an incredible MPEG-4 ABC codec in a 240 to 1 aspect ratio and a DTS HD Master Audio 5.1 soundtrack, Blu-ray.com gives both the video and audio quality four and a half stars each. This film is region A locked and extras include a director's audio commentary, a 30 minute featurette with the cast and crew, 17 minutes of deleted scenes, and an eight minute featurette with the real life family of the boxers talking about their family history. Also released this week, Sharktopus. Yes, it's a movie about a hybrid shark slash octopus that terrorizes the town. So it won't surprise you to learn that it's from Roger Corman, who's famous for bringing the campy terror. It's region A locked and Blu-ray.com says that the MPEG-4 AVC 1.78 to 1 transfer is generally serviceable, but occasionally disappointing, unquote. The lossless Dolby True HD 5.1 soundtrack is solid, and quote, quite good given the quality and origins of the film, unquote. And as always, check out our show notes at techzilla.com or hdnation.tv for the rest of this week's Blu-ray releases. Hey, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, the Motorola Zoom. The Motorola Zoom is the first tablet powered by Android 3.0, aka Honeycomb, with a 10.1 inch HD widescreen display, 3D interface, and one gigahertz dual core processor. Fully flash enabled for video rich web and tabbed windows for multitasking and Chrome bookmark syncing with Google Maps that you can tilt, rotate, and zoom into 3D with PhotoReal Street View. It's 4G upgradable, so you can leap from 3G to Verizon 4G LTE and the mind-melting upper limits of speed. Check out the Motorola Zoom. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick. A free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week, Notepad++, yes. Notepad is great for simple text editing, and Word is great for full-fledged word processing, but what if you want something in between? Check out Notepad++. It's designed by and for programmers, but you don't have to know code to find it useful. Just having tabs for your multiple text documents makes it worth checking out. You also get line numbering, find and replace over multiple documents, a side-by-side -side view, and yes, there is a spell checker. They even offer a portable version, so if you're looking for the simplicity of Notepad without sacrificing the usability, check out Notepad++. Puget Custom Computers at PugetSystems.com sent us a custom home theater PC build that's the latest addition to the company's Serenity line. Sadly, I think we're going to say, we have to send it back. I agree <laughs> wholeheartedly. Uh, basically, this is Oh, sorry. Oh, we're talking about, this is a quad-core system. Uh, basically, it's Intel's Core i5, 2500K quad-core part, running at 3.3 gigahertz. Yay! Dropped into a beautiful Asus P8H67-M Evo motherboard. Let's take a look on the inside of this thing. This is really, this is one of the more tightly and beautifully put together systems I've looked at in a long time. Look, there's foam for absorption. There is a lot of sound management going on inside of this box. Uh, Basically, I just run down some of the parts that are in here. They have a couple of sticks of memory, basically two four gig sticks that add up to eight gigabytes. Four, did I say megabytes? Gigabytes. Two four <laughs> gigabyte sticks that add up to eight gigabytes of memory. They have uh, Intel X, uh, X25M 120 gig SSD, which is really nice, the boot drive. And to back that up, they have a Western Digital Caviar Green 2 terabyte drive as well. Asus Blu ray burner. Not just a Blu-ray ROM or Blu-ray reader, but right. it actually burns the Blu-ray disc at 12x. This is also a custom Antec case, the uh, NSK2480 Micro ATX case. And also we have a Seasonics X560 PSU. It's over in the corner here. The Scythe, big shuriken. Oh, I love this. CPU cooler. 
I gotta say that's a that's an impressive CPU cooler. Overall, it's quiet. Quiet. When I fire the system up, that's the only time you'll hear the fans. Right when it first boots, once it gets past posting and gets into the system itself, mm -hmm. the system becomes quiet. Uh, quieter than my i3 based home theater PC that I showed off a couple weeks ago, uh, a few episodes ago. It won, that's a pretty compact system. This box with a slightly larger case and the extra the high density foam that they've used to quiet down certain ports and the top of the case itself does a phenomenal job. When it's actually fully booted up, I opened up the case and the power supply fan isn't actually spinning up. Wow. I imagine if the temperatures rise significantly in the apartment I'm in, it would start to spin up. But the only thing that was really running was one 120 millimeter fan drawing air from the side and that basically blows it right toward the CPU cooler that takes care of it and just vents out the back. So for this, I noticed like having uh, oh. built and then gotten rid of an Antec case for home theater PC in the past because it, it had the, the one I had had the big blue display on the front oh. that actually made it impossible to view the TV. It was so bright. That's annoying. If this is actually a custom plate. Is the foam that they're using inside of this for sand absorption custom also or is that standard? It is. It's a kit specific to this case. Mm -hmm. And this is also, I think it's more also for the, the way they've managed the fans in terms of how the motherboard's set up. Being able to just to put everything in its lowest speed modes really enhances how quiet this system is. I mean, at full operation, you literally have to put your ear right up against it to even hear it. And I, comparatively, I have on my smaller uh, home theater PC case a smaller fan on the back that spins right. faster to move similar amounts of air. Which and makes more noise. Exactly. And also, for a system like this, too, it really comes down to what they include in the box, and they do a phenomenal job of documentation. This included everything from every benchmark they ran through it, all the system components that you need. Uh, a series of benchmarks, including temperature readings, all the parts lists that came with it. Phenomenal build quality. Oh, and also, you get not only your backup disks, your Windows disk, the motherboard disk, the Blu-ray drive, it, it comes with everything. It's really well documented, put together like that. But what really blew me away also was just benchmark performance. I ran two video encoding benchmarks to gauge the performance of this box in its i5 part, basically. And I was mm -hmm. comparing that to the my i3-based home theater PC and my i7-based workstation that I use for everything, as well as an old uh, home theater PC that I showed off a while back that was based on Admin Ion technology, mm -hmm. uh, Intel and NVIDIA, respectively. What really kind of blew me away here was uh, performance. In a word, it's impressive if you're trying to do media encoding. Uh, running ArcSoft's Media Encoder 7 application that supports GPU as well as Intel QuickSync basically the Sandy Bridge based optimizations for doing that sort of encoding. This PC bested my i uh, bested the uh, i3 HD PC that I built by about 6 seconds while maintaining very low CPU usage, usually under 20%. And that might not sound like a lot, but my overclocked i7 workstation took about uh, about one one and a half times a little bit more than that longer to complete that same task, and that was consuming a lot more electricity too, but even more impressive was running something like Handbrake, that's CPU-based encoding, right. not necessarily taking advantage of the latest Sandy Bridge hooks yet. That was sweet. Uh, basically, I took a one gig test file of 1080p video, and I used the iPhone 4 preset that's built into Handbrake. 356 seconds later, with an average of 97 watts, this thing completed it. And compare that to my i7 workstation that did the same task in about you know 332 seconds, or about, say, 20 seconds quicker. But my i7 workstation was consuming about 210 watts and during that whole process. Noise. Oh, <laughs> most definitely. <laughs> and the i3 home theater PC took about two and a half times as long to complete the same encoding task at about 853 seconds at about 80 watts. So comparing that to the Atom Ion box, or no, actually compared to the i3 box, just for just a little bit more wattage, you get a lot more performance in terms of doing things like video encoding. And with the performance the system offers, if you it doesn't it uses Intel integrated graphics as it sits here right now, but you you have an expansion slot or two for video cards if you want to turn this into a full fledged gaming PC. Mm -hmm. However, uh, with that kind of expansion and the silence all in one package, I, I really have nothing bad to say at all about this box. This is not it. it, it, it Pooch is kind of a boutique manufacturer. They they make a you know they're not a Dell, they're not an HP. No, custom mostly. We should point out the, the, a lot of what you're paying for in this is you know the quiet case, the customizations they've done. Fourteen hundred dollars for entry level system, two thousand as tested. Totally, Do and it doesn't even have the four hundred dollars seat and tuner in it yet. And that's the, <laughs> that'd be the first thing. This would turn into my cable box in a heartbeat if I could keep it. So, but I'm not. So. I'll call that a thumbs up. <laughs> oh yeah, most definitely. I love it. I love seeing well built systems, well documented, and yes, you you get what you pay for. I, I suspect we'll see some of the some of the setup in here in your next <sighs> home theater PC build. I, micro micro ATX motherboards, I'm just a fan of that small form factor. Unless you have a reason to have extra slots and stuff like that, it's just, ah, just convenient.
fits in a cigar box. Yeah. Hey, let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, Maru's iPad Covers. SG Bumper Technology protects your iPad's corners as well as securely holds the tablet in place. Perfect for anyone looking to stay stylish while offering superior protection. Numerous all original designs allow for an iPad cover that complements your lifestyle. And with the launch of the iPad 2, Maru will be releasing new designs and patterns soon. Go to maru.com slash techzilla for 10% off your total purchase. And be sure to follow Maru on Twitter, at Maru. We talked about scanning film negatives last week. Got quite a few responses from people who have done it themselves. Chip writes in, I was a photojournalist in the Army back in 1975 and had a few boxes full of negatives, which I wanted to digitize. I found the Wolverine F2D 35mm film to digital converter. It worked great and was under 100 bucks on Amazon. It did take some time, but was well worth the effort. I then emailed some of the old photos to my Army buddies. They loved it. Thanks, Chip, retired Sergeant Major, U.S. Army. Dusan chimed in with some pointers. Number one, it is absolutely essential to get a scanner which includes a calibration target. Though you may see almost identical models with drastic price differences just due to the availability of the calibration target, do not go cheap. It is worth every cent. Calibrate after every restart. It's quick, it's easy and automatic. No hassles like with TV screen calibrations. Number two, APS and 110 millimeter format films are smaller than 35 millimeter. It is completely okay to do what we've been doing in good old days of film. Place the smaller format negative in a larger holder frame. Scanners allow you to frame the area you want to scan in the software. Keep in mind, particularly for 110 film, that even cranking the resolution up won't help much with the detail, because there's not much detail there. Molecules on the film are only so big. As for 35mm, going over 3600 dpi is not useful in most cases. Everything best, Dusan and Babylon, New York. P.S. I use Plustex Optic Film 7500i, and both the results and reliability are excellent. I'm surprised folks came up with a few good hardware options out there that they would recommend. I yeah. would think that would be the, uh, it seems like it is a lot of work, but apparently if you do take your time, and apparently a calibration target-based <laughs> scanning seems to be the way to go, but you can do it yourself. I'm just the impression that if, if you can find a company that does it reliably and they have the high-end equipment, I think for a lot of people that's the way to go, but it's good to see there are some hard hardware options out there for folks who don't mind getting their fingers a little Our, our favorite dirty. digital camera reviewer is of the same mind. Send it to a service because it's boring and it tends to be expensive. Well, it's also, it's kind of funny though, one of the things Lori also said, we talked about this in the past, is that film scanners, negative scanners, they're one of the rare things in technology that doesn't change like every 20 minutes. It's like, you know, if you turn around inside Office Depot, there's like three new printers that weren't there five minutes ago. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? And it's the, basically the same specs as the last printer, just with a new cartridge that may or may not be more expensive to upgrade, but. Very cool. It's, it's interesting that this is one of those areas, because, you know, I guess because film's dying, they don't need to upgrade the the products that often. Every, every time I want to re-rip my disc collection, I'm always thinking I'd rather have a robotic arm doing it, but I can just get the kid next door to sit at my workstation for, you know, half a day for maybe 10 bucks and a couple of candy bars and have them just swap the discs out. It's not the same with film scanning, though. That's usually a very personal piece of tech that you would want to make sure it looks right and is right. And Darn, darn, there's a lot of good options out there. So. Techzilla. Because both of us were exploited <laughs> as children. We're good with exploiting child labor today. Yes. That's humor people don't call Congress. I have candy. <laughs> <laughs> it just... Email us, techzilla3.com, <laughs> tech out product reviews, how to's, angry, angry, vindictive, cranky letters about our inappropriate sense of humor. Hey, fire them on in. We need your emails, people. Don't be shy. Send your questions to techzilla at revision3.com. Yep, and as always, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash techzilla or tweet us at techzilla, at Veronica, at Patrick Norton, and at Robert Heron. And thank you so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Till next time, you've been watching Techzilla. Gazelle accepts more than 300,000 products from over 20 different electronics categories. Shipping is free on all items of value, and in most cases, they'll even send you a box to ship with. 
Also, for you green folks out there, Gazelle makes all the recycling partners adhere to some strict policies. No exports, no landfill policies, and a ton of data security standards. Gazelle is a great way to get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone or Android phone. Just go to www.gazelle.com to learn more.